and go and perhaps trying to swim to the bank. The luck turned all right before long. The eddying current carrying several barrels close ashore at one point and there a little while they struck against the hidden route. Then Bilbo took the opportunity of scrambling up the side of his barrel while it was held steady against another. Up he crawled like a drowned rat and lay on the top spread out to keep the balance as best he could. The breeze was cold but better than the water and he hoped it would not suddenly roll off again and they started off once more. Before long, the barrels broke free and turned and twisted off down the stream and off into the main current. Then he found it quite as difficult to stick as he had feared, but he managed it somehow, though it was miserably uncomfortable. Luckily, he was very light and the barrel was a good bit big and, being rather leaky, had now shipped a small amount of water for weight. All the same, it was like trying to ride, without bridle or stirrups, a round-bellied pony that was always thinking of rolling in the grass. In this way, at last, Mr Baggins came to a place where the trees on either side of the bank grew thinner. He could see the paler sky between them. The dark river suddenly opened wide and it was joined by the main water of the forest river flowing down in haste from the king's great doors. There was a dim sheet of water no longer overshadowed and on its sliding surface there was dancing and broken reflections of clouds and of stars. Then the hurrying water of the forest river swept all the company of casks and tubs away to the north bank, in which it had eaten out a wide bay. This was a shingly shore, under hanging banks, and it was walled on the eastern end by a little jutting cape of hard rock. On the shallow shore most of the barrels ran aground, though a few went on to bump against the stony pier. There were people on the lookout on the banks. They quickly poled and pushed all the barrels together in the shallows, and when they had counted them, they roped them together and left them till the morning. Poor dwarfs. Bilbo was not badly off now. He slipped from his barrel and waded ashore and then sneaked along to some huts that he could see near the water's edge. He no longer thought twice about picking up a supper uninvited if he got the chance. He had been obliged to do it for so long and he knew only too well what it was like to be really hungry, not merely politely interested in the dainties of a well-filled larder. Also, he had caught a glimpse of a fire through the trees, and that appealed to him with his dripping and ragged clothes clinging to him cold and clammy. There is no need to tell you much of his adventures that night, for now we are drawing near the end of the eastward journey and coming at last to the greatest adventure, so we must hurry on. Of course, helped by his magic ring, he got on very well at first, but he was given away in the end by his wet footsteps and the trail of drippings that he left wherever he went or sat, and also he began to snivel and... Wherever he tried to hide, he was found out by the terrific explosions of his suppressed sneezes. Very soon there was a fine commotion in the village by the riverside, but Bilbo escaped into the woods carrying a loaf and a leather bottle of wine and a pie that did not belong to him. The rest of the night he had to pass wet as he was and far from the fire, but the bottle helped him to do that, and he actually dozed a little on some dry leaves, even though the year was getting late and the air was chilly. He woke again with especially loud sneeze. It was already grey morning and there was a merry racket down by the river. They were making up a raft of barrels and the raft elves would soon be steering it off down the stream to Lake Town. Bilbo sneezed again. He was no longer dripping but he felt cold all over. He scrambled down as fast as his stiff legs could take him and managed just in time to get onto the mass of casks without being noticed in the general bustle. Luckily there was no sun at the time to cast an awkward shadow and for a mercy he did not see knees again for a good while. There was a mighty pushing of poles. The elves that were standing in the shallow water heaved and shoved. The barrels now all lashed together and creaked and fretted. This is a heavy load, some grumbled. They float too deep. Some of these are never empty. If they had come ashore in the daylight, we might have had a look inside, they said. No time now, cried the raftum. Shove off! And off they went at last, slowly at first, until they had passed the point of rock where other elves stood to fend them off with poles, and then quicker and quicker as they caught the main stream and went sailing away down, down towards the lake. They had escaped the dungeons of the king and were through the wood, but whether alive or dead still remains to be seen. End of chapter 9